brought to you by PrayLatin.com, makers of prayer cards featuring complete English phonetic renderings of Latin pronunciations. One of the most important cardinals in the church has outed himself as an open heretic, and the heresy he has chosen is the most grotesque side of modernism imaginable. Due to the sensibilities of this place, we'll just call it the uh, James Martin sin. This cardinal is, surprise, surprise, a Jesuit. And some observant minds have noticed that pretty much all of the major figures in the synodal church of the new advent are Jesuits. Francis, himself a Jesuit, has surrounded himself with Jesuits, which begs a question. What's going on here? Is there any sin promoted by Jesuits that Francis won't support? We know that he doesn't support the actual Catholic faith. That's obvious given his various statements against rigidity and the need to be open to the God of surprises, whoever that is, and how we cannot be attached to our preconceived beliefs. But what is going on here is the question of the moment. So why don't we take a look at the story to get an idea? How do we get to a place with cardinals openly talking about wanting the church to embrace the James Martin sin, which scripture inerrantly tells us cries out to heaven for justice? Sandra Magister gives us a hint on his blog, Headline, Francis's team in command of the church, all Jesuits. Yep, all Jesuits all the time. And the few who aren't members of the Jesuit order may as well be Jesuits themselves. Men like Cardinal Arthur Roach, the destroyer of tradition, come to mind for that one, for example. But Jesuits have since well before the Second Vatican non-binding pastoral council have been agents of revolution in the church, promoting all sorts of demonic changes to the faith of the church. And now that we're ruled over by hirelings who are largely Jesuits, the results have been predictable. As Sandra Magister says, quote, incredible but true. Just now, now in a few decades, it has lost a good half of its forces. The Society of Jesus has surged to the heights of command of the Catholic Church as never before. Francis's story is well known. He is the first Jesuit Pope in history. He, notwithstanding, had more adversaries than friends in the society and took care not to set foot in its general curia when he came to Rome as a cardinal. But the innovation is that in this last phase of his pontificate, declining in age but not in ambitions, Francis has equipped himself with a veteran attack team, all his own and made up entirely of Jesuits. The top man of this team is without a doubt Cardinal Jean-Claude Hollerick, Archbishop of Luxembourg, top man in Jorge Mario Bergoglio's plans, both for today and for tomorrow. For today, the task assigned to him by Francis is to steer as Relator General the World Synod that got underway in 2021 and will last at least until 2024. But in the Pope's mind even beyond, with the task of remodeling the church under the banner of none other than a permanent quote-unquote synodality, while for tomorrow it is no mystery that Hollerick is also Francis's candidate in peccatore, for his succession, on which the current synod will have decisive influence, effectively obliging the future pope, whoever he may be, to take delivery on and continue the, quote, process a bit as happened to Paul VI with the Vatican Council inherited from John XXIII, end quote. So Cardinal Hollerick is Francis's choice to succeed him, or so Sandra Magister says. And there's a pleasant thought, isn't it? Cardinal Hollerick is Pope Francis II, the sequel no one wants, but one we might get, brought to you by the same people who brought the church the guy who said that Catholics must obey the United Nations. Even our worst secular enemies don't usually say things like that, but Francis did a few years ago. But Cardinal Hollerick is an interesting figure to consider. Like Francis, he comes from a country that isn't that influential in modern church affairs. Whereas Francis came from Argentina, Hollerick comes from Luxembourg, a country that Frankly, most Catholics tend to forget even exists, if we're being honest with ourselves. And while he has considerable influence in the church now, a lot of a country's influence in the church comes from the size of that country's Catholic population. And of course, the wealth that can that they can transfer to Rome via donation and political action. Which is why Hollerick is such an odd figure to be influential in the church, since Luxembourg isn't exactly a poor country by any stretch of the imagination, but it is tiny to the point where it doesn't exactly have much of a hierarchy. And what is Hollerick using this influence for? Well, let's take a break from Sandro Magister's piece, which we'll come back to in a moment here, and check out Cath.net, the German news outlet. 
For Hollerick says the church's teaching on this James Martin sin is wrong, that such unnatural acts are a fruit of creation, meaning positively willed by the creator, meaning God is okay and wants the James Martin sin and actively wills people doing it. Now, that's news to me since I've actually, you know, read the Bible cover to cover a few times and I never got that impression. In fact, I got the opposite impression from reading inerrant sacred scripture. Cath.net's article is really revealing here, and it's not very long. Quote, Cardinal Jean-Claude Hollerich, Archbishop of Luxembourg and Relator General of the Synod on Synodality, wants a, quote, change in the cultural paradigm of the church regarding the condemnation of the uh, <clears throat> James Martin sin. In his estimation, there is a higher proportion of practitioners of that sin in church institutions than in society. Wow, <laughs> he said in an interview with Vatican newspaper L'Osservatore Romano. At the beginning of the interview, he praised Francis, who is not a liberal, but a radical. Francis's radicalism consists in mercy, which concerns us all. Quoting Cardinal Hollerich directly, We must all ask ourselves what it means to be a Christian today, the Cardinal said. The key question for the current pontificate is whether to accept the inadequacy of a pastoral ministry that is the daughter of earlier eras and is ready to reconsider mission. This decision has serious and courageous theological implications, Hollerich noted. This will be shown, among other things, in the balance between lay people and clergy, which will be very different in the future from the current one. This is both a consequence of the synod on synodality and the decline in vocations. Regarding the, quote, discrimination against the practitioners of the James Martin sin, Hollerich said that the church had to change the cultural environment so that the approach to the sin in question became more positive. When asked about the example of the Protestant churches, which, despite the blessing of the James Martin pairings, did not find any additional support among young people, Hollerich replied, of course not, because that's not enough. He called for a, quote, profound change in the cultural paradigm and a change of heart in the Catholic Church. In Hollerich's view, opening up to the practitioners of the James Martin sin is not a question of canon law, norms, and structures. That's what the Pope said to the Church in Germany. The proclamation of the gospel today means proclaiming the joy of life in God, finding the meaning of life in Jesus Christ. It is the job of the Church to proclaim the, quote, good news not a set of rules or prohibitions. No one should be excluded, not even divorced and civil law remarried or practitioners of the James Martin sin. The kingdom of God is not an exclusive club, the Cardinal says. It's opened its gates to everyone without discrimination. The Cardinal demanded that no one should feel left out. It's not about theological subtleties or ethical dissertations. It's just about saying that the message of Christ is for everyone, he said, literally. He believes that the James Martin sin is a fruit of creation. God approves his work at every step of creation. End lengthy quote. You see why I said he's a heretic. The article goes on to say that the church must find value in the emotional relationships of the people we're talking about here. That's odd, to be honest with you, given that the church has said that romantic love was never a prerequisite for a good holy marriage to begin with. So why are we concerned now with emotional attachments? In matters of the flesh, your emotions will lie to you very often. Just think back to toxic relationships you may have been in yourself in your own past or ones that you know of personally or can bring to mind involving other people. Part of the pur purpose of normalizing unthinkable sins like this is to appeal to younger Catholics. That's their stated purpose, which Hollerick hints at in one of the interviews he's given on this subject. But really, the most important critical point is that Francis has assembled a veritable dream team of modernists to run the hierarchy. According to Sandra Magister, surrounding Francis are 11 Jesuits in the most critical key command positions in the Roman Curia. And that's an interesting number by itself, all things considered. But even more interesting is that Francis has sidelined old-fashioned Jesuits who were, weren't liberal, at least compared to him, they weren't liberal enough for his taste, and he's replaced them with wild modernist hirelings that will push the agenda ever further. I often see people saying that Francis is being controlled by others, but I assure you that it's Francis the one who's doing the controlling, and he has had plenty of help from the Cardinal Hollerichs of the Church. Back to the article, quote, 
But in addition to Hollerick, there are two other Jesuits whom Francis has recently made cardinals and has put on the team in important roles. The first is the Canadian Michael Cherney, for many years more a competitor than a co-worker of the Ghanaian Cardinal Peter K. A. Turkson, first at the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace, and then at the Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development. Yeah, that Dicastery does exist, and yes, you can guess it was started under Francis, of which Cherney has become pre prefect, prefect. He was also the Special Secretary for the Synod for the Amazon. From the defense of nature to those to people who move around, to the popular movements, he is the man Bergoglio avails himself of in these fields he favors. The second is the Italian Gianfranco Gerolanda, former rector of the Pontifical Gregorian University and a seasoned expert in canon law. Among his tasks is that of translating into juridical provisions the imperious acts that Francis carries out with the air of an absolute monarch. From Girlanda, for example, came the perfunctory conclusion of the long-standing theological dispute between powers of orders, those derived from Episcopal ordination, and powers of jurisdiction, those conferred by a higher authority, opting for the latter in order to place some lay people as well, men or women, at the head of the Vatican Curia, with the simple mandate of the Pope. Again, from Girlanda and the role of juridical factotum, at the service of Francis came the dismantling and refounding imposed by the, by the Pope on the Order of Malta. But that's not all. Also among Jesuits who are not cardinals, there are some whom the Pope has placed in key roles at his service. In the General Secretariat of the Synod of Bishops, there is a consultant who is in fact the associate closest to Cardinal Hollerick. It is Father Giacomo Costa, former editor of the magazine Aggiornamenti Sociali of the Milan Jesuits and Vice President of the Fondazione Carlo Maria Martini, not to mention Father Antonio Spadaro, editor of La Civilita Cattolica, and very close to Francis since his elevation as Pope. He, too, very active and urgent in promoting the world synod on synodality, and in particular in involving in the adventure, with important help from his predecessor at La Civilita Cattolica, Bartolomeo Sorge, who passed away in 2020. The, the Italian Episcopal Conference initially very distrustful. End quote. And then add to that, the Jesuits pretty much run the financial arms of the church, and you get a pretty clear picture of how the church is being run by ultra-ideological loyalists to Francis and his particular vision of Jesuit philosophy. Not just by Jesuits, but by Jesuits who are part of his faction in the Jesuit order. As Sandro Magister points out, Bergoglio had a habit of avoiding Jesuit facilities in Rome when he was just a, just Cardinal Bergoglio, before the St. Gallen group put him on the throne of Peter. It's widely reported that influential Jesuits wrote reports begging John Paul II not to promote Bergoglio, but that he made him first a bishop and then eventually a cardinal, despite what his fellow, fellow Jesuits had to say on the matter. That, of course, has left the most aware fans of JP2 among conservative and tradition-leaning Catholics scratching their heads. But remember, it is hindsight is always twenty twenty, and we don't know what information JP2 had in those days, but we have information now about not only Francis, but his likely successors, including Halderick and begs the question, will this period of rule by the Jesuits continue after Francis is gone? Well, let me know what you think about this in the comments, please. Like and subscribe if you haven't, it really does help. Sharing this on social media helps a lot too. As always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.